Luke has the opportunity. Luke has the opportunity, as Gary did, to travel across our footprint to meet with our clients and be in different markets and learn from different industries. And we've heard so much about labor issues, supply chain, inflation. And hopefully today, Luke and Adaman, you'll give us some clarity or ways to think about the, the, what we're hearing you know, in the market today. So I really look forward to your comments on kind of, I would call it this changing economy. So with that, Luke, uh, let me turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Amy. I should start by saying, can you hear me? All right, good, I see thumbs up. 18 months into this, I can still make the mistake of, uh, of not uh, unmuting. Um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come here and uh, speak to all of you. Uh, as Amy said, I really wish it was in person and hopefully we will get to that someday. And also, uh, I'm, I big shoes to fill with uh, Gary. I know that he was part of this uh, for since the inception, like Nick was saying. And um, and when he was leaving, I think he retired, and it was in early July. I basically had a meeting with him and said, "Okay, what are the things that I, I make sure that I need to do?" And there were there was a list of maybe four presentation and groups that I absolutely needed to speak to each year, and this was one of them. And think about the size of MTs. Uh, footprint, but that commitment to this uh, this organization and this presentation is big, and that's exactly what he, he told me I needed to do, and I'd be happy to do it anyway. My favorite part of my job is coming and speaking to businesses and hearing from businesses, and as I said, uh, hoping to do that in person sometime in the future. So I am going to talk about the economy and the changing economy. Amy, I don't know if we're able to uh, share slides or not. It says the host has uh, disabled slides, and I can certainly do it uh, without uh, that, and uh, happy to do so. Um, in my role at Wilmington Trust, our, our job is to, my job is to um, monitor the economy, look for those changes, the ones that are going to be affecting asset classes, and it looks like I am able to share uh, these slides now. And this is our, our routine slide deck that we use uh, with clients as we talk about the economy, as we talk about asset classes. I'm just going to touch on a few of the major things that are affecting the economy at the national level and certainly uh, down at the county level, and I think some of the businesses – uh, that are here. And again, I, I try to take about 20 minutes or so. We always start with uh, our core narrative. Anything that we write about, anything that we're doing, our um, views on the economy and portfolios tie back to what we refer to as our core narrative. How are we viewing the world right now? I'm not going to go through all of the bits of this, uh, all of the bits and pieces. We can distribute these slides afterwards. But it's safe to say that our core narrative is still positive. We have a positive view of the U.S. economy. Uh, certainly of our area, and it all ties back to some of those changes that Nick referenced. It has to do with consumer spending. It has to do with CapEx. Um, we believe that the economy is going continue, to continue to improve, and that plays through to some of our uh, asset class positioning. And I'm going to talk about some of those details, but I should also say it is with risks. You know, we have the Delta variant of COVID uh, spreading, and we can see that it's already affecting consumer behavior again, even if we don't have government mandated uh, lockdowns. And we also have a risk of inflation moving higher, even though our baseline case and our view is that it will decelerate. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But really, the takeaway is that we're pretty optimistic about the economy with those risks. So I'm showing a chart now, and hopefully you can see it, of GDP growth each year since 2014. And with some uh, coloration to separate the impact of the private economy in sort of an orange or a beige color, and then also the impact of uh, fiscal go government from the, uh, from the federal level, and that's in the purple, and then the dots and the line is overall GDP growth. So there's a few uh, distinctive features of what we're showing here. One is that over time, before the pandemic, it's usually the private economy that's driving uh, overall economic performance. Obviously, 2020 was a sharp departure from that trend where we had growth of uh, you know, below negative 3%. And you can see that the private economy uh, contracted significantly, almost down to the 7.5% level, while we got that government stimulus, that positive purple area uh, from the, the federal government. And that dynamic of the federal government 
uh, and stimulus contributing to growth continues in 2021 with that, that positive purple area giving us what we think uh, will end up at about 7.5% this year. We're in the process of revising this down because of some of the uh, impacts from Delta. But we also, obviously, a distinguishing feature here is in 2021, we've had significant growth in the private economy compared to last year. The real key point, I think, when we think about next year is that last bar to the far right. Uh, fiscal spending is, is slated to be a drag on the economy in 2022. And anything I say here about fiscal policy is not an endorsement of one party or the other or one policy or the other. I'm just an economist. I call balls and strikes and I say, <laughs> what's going to happen? Uh, and that purple area being negative in 2022 might be uh, kind of surprising, but it's, it all matters like what happened last year and how is it changing? So uh, to think about it in very simple terms, if a government pumps $4 trillion into the economy in one year, how much would it have to pump in the next year to be a contributor to growth? And the answer is $4 trillion and $1. Uh, anything less than that, you know, $3.9 trillion, it's going to be a drag on the economy. And clearly, we've had a lot of stimulus over the past two years, including January of this year and then March again of this year. We're not going to get as much spending from the federal government in 2022 as we have uh, this year or the, the previous year. And that's why we're essentially, from a GDP perspective, starting in a hole, as you can see there, that purple area for 2022, negative 2.7%. But we are optimistic that we're going to get that positive contribution from the private economy, uh, assuming no new legislation, and that's an important growth of about 2.75% next year with you know, you can see the private economy expanding almost on par with what it has done this year. Now, we know that there is an infrastructure bill that has uh, made it through the Senate, the bipartisan plan, the $550 billion, slated to be voted on by the House later uh, this month. I think by September 27th is the promise that the Speaker of the House, Pelosi, uh, made to her moderate uh, the part of her party. Uh, and then if we also get that large three and a half trillion dollar uh, social spending stimulus, however you want to refer to it, plan, and clearly this is um, uh, still in the works and that level, I think, will change. It'll probably come in less than three and a half trillion. That would add to growth next year. Uh, but even with those additions, we're really the takeaway here is that we're counting on the private economy to be contributing to growth next year while uh, the federal government steps back, uh, even if we get those other two packages. And that's really important. And it's sort of where, where do we see that private growth coming from uh, is the main question. We see consumer spending uh, changing quite a bit. So this is a picture of all of consumer spending, and it's broken into three categories. We talk about goods and services a lot, uh, and this is all based back to February 2020, pre-pandemic. They're all equal to 100 right at uh, the pre-pandemic level. And then you can see the crazy change that we've had in goods and then services. And the, the other thing that we do here is we break services spending into those that you would expect to be moving around with the cycle, things like recreation, travel, uh, restaurants and, and bars, um, those things that really bounce around with the economy as the purple line, and then the, the grayish line are those things like just paying uh, rent or mortgage, uh, paying your utilities, uh, financial fees, insurance that are not really as sensitive. You can see that that's pretty flat with the exception where there was a lot of spending by nonprofits uh, around the pandemic, but it's pretty flat. So what has happened, and this is really the key as we look forward and think about the changes in spending that you as businesses, I think, are probably experiencing already. Well, spending on goods surged 20% above the pre-pandemic peak right now, and you can see where that has actually stepped down from a previous peak, and we're starting to slow that down. And that's completely understandable, right? We had a pandemic, everybody's locked in their homes, you can't go spend on services and hotels and vacations. We had a lot of money sent out to individuals. And what did they do? They spent it on physical goods. Uh, and I speak to people all over our footprint. I speak to people um, in your area, uh, people with different kinds of businesses, anybody that was uh, selling goods, uh, as, as I like to say, people were fortifying their homes for the quarantine environment. People bought patios, uh, decks, backyard swimming pools, exercise equipment, treadmills, Pelotons, all of that kind of stuff uh, at the expense of not spending on services. And you can see how the orange line surged above that pre-recession peak. 
Now, it has been falling basically for four months straight, and this is in nominal terms when we take out inflation and show it in real terms. Uh, you can see where the orange line is actually even coming down faster. And that's, I think, a healthy development. A lot of businesses that produce physical goods have experienced a lot of stress over the past year and even meeting their customers' demands and that kind of uh, challenges. And I'm going to talk about the impact that this has had on inflation in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and while that spending on goods is coming down, and uh, we think will continue to come down, we're getting stronger spending on that magenta or purple line, which is the services. With the reopening of the economy, with vaccines earlier this year, there was a lot more spending on airlines. People started to go on vacations. I went out uh, you know, a couple of times this summer, not quite making up for what I would have uh, done last year, uh, but certainly contributing to that bounce back in services. So if your business is in an area where you sell physical goods to customers, you've probably experienced that surge and maybe a little bit of a uh, relief or a little bit of a letdown over the past couple of months, but still very busy. And services have started to pick up. And we really do think uh, that this dynamic is going to continue. And one of the key questions going forward, and I mentioned uh, GDP is starting to look like it might come in a little bit lower this year. The Delta variant and the spread of COVID uh, are slowing that, that magenta line on the bottom. Look like it might be pushing off some spending in the third quarter here. Now, where are uh, consumers getting the wherewithal to spend? A lot of it is coming from savings. Uh, we sent, you know, the, the government sent out a lot of stimulus last year. And no matter what survey, and it, and it certainly boosted spending, people spent a lot of that money. But if you look at any survey from any group, um, lots of different sources, when we look at banking data, when we look at Federal Reserve data, people basically said they were going to do a third, a third, and a third. A third of stimulus money they were going to spend, a third of it they were going to pay down bills, and a third of it they were going to save. And what I'm showing here is total savings across the economy going back, as you can see, over a very long time period, going back to 1975. Uh, it's an orange line that moves up and to the right. So there's a trend as population grows and as there's inflation, and this is in nominal terms. So we put that dotted line, the trend behind it, and then the magenta line on the bottom is deviation from trend. So if you think of this as how much do consumers have uh, socked away in checking and savings and money market accounts relative to that sort of a reliable upward trend, it's through the roof. It's over $3 trillion, and that's just of the, of the first quarter of this year. And you can see in the previous cycle, 2008, 9, and 10, where there was excess savings at that time too. And then if you look at late 2009, early 2010, consumers starting to draw down those levels of savings, those contributed to growth in 2009 and 10 and as we went forward. Well, we have even more savings uh, uh, socked away right now, and in addition to the job growth that we expect, which is going to be wage and salary income, we also expect these savings will contribute to consumer spending growth as we go forward. An important caveat here and something that we at Wilmington Trust and M&T and everybody sort of trying to get their hands around is the distribution of these savings. Uh, and this is incredibly important because if these were distributed evenly across all households, which they're not, uh, but if they were, it would be on the order of about $20,000 excess savings per household across the country. Uh, and it's nowhere near that. It's much, when we look at, we can look at uh, data of our, our own personal data at M&T. We look at other uh, large banks that sort of publish reports on this. The median is much lower, like the median household with their elevated balances are up a significant amount, but it's from something of an account like maybe $3,000 up to $5,000 or so. So we're not seeing where everybody across the country has a massive stockpile of savings. It's much more distributed to the upper end of the uh, spectrum, and that has ramifications for how quickly uh, it gets spent out, if, if spent at all. Um, but suffice to say that, that we believe that it's distributed enough that we'll continue to see this contribute to growth as we go forward. The thinking, moving now from the consumer and sort of the expectations there and thinking about businesses and CapEx, and this is obviously something that's near and dear to all of you, uh, CapEx is the lifeblood of future growth for companies and for the economy. This is comparing CapEx in this recession, orange line, in this recession and recovery, to the previous two recessions, the financial crisis uh, and recession that started in 2007 and then the previous tech bubble in 2001. And basically, how did it change from just before the recession? How many quarters did it take to recover? Uh, and you can see here the striking difference. This recession was 
violent and fast, and the recovery has been sharp as well. To the point where the orange line is above zero, that just means that total CapEx across the economy has already surpassed its pre-recession peak. Now, what's not shown here, but is critical when we think about businesses uh, across the footprint is where are these dollars going? This is the national data. When we look into the national data, uh, again, the, just like uh, sort of like goods and services were uh, very different for the consumer, when we think about CapEx for businesses, CapEx can go into physical space, uh, buildings, uh, either new buildings or substantial rehabilitation of new buildings or civil engineering uh, structures, or it can go into uh, plants, equipment, and machinery, and like software and computers and servers. All of the increase that we've seen in this orange line, all of it has been on the, the latter category, the second category. It's been in computers, software, servers, research and development, uh, and all of those things that businesses like you have had to do to make it through the pandemic, to make yourselves more productive when there is a lack of labor or, you know, when you need to create an app so that your customers can pick the thing up on the curbside, you need to develop software for that. The first part of CapEx, the building of physical structures, uh, is still negative. Seven consecutive quarters where it is still not just below pre-recession peak, but still moving down. Uh, and that is obviously hitting different businesses in different ways. Um, but I think one of the more positive things here, and we have a positive view for CapEx, is all indicators that we have, whether it's architecture billings, um, surveys, uh, intentions of businesses, is that we're going to start to see a turnaround, a bottoming out of that second category, the um, building on, on physical space. And even though we're going to see a slowing of the other one, the building, the software equipment and machinery, it's still going to be a contributor to growth, we believe, as we go forward. So uh, consumers, pretty positive on the savings and also the job growth uh, and CapEx, it looks like we're going to see a turnaround for the category that has been lagging. Let me just make a few comments about inflation and some of the implications for the Fed and interest rates. One of the things that Nick said at the beginning, uh, challenges about uh, supply chains, and we've seen it show up in inflation. It's certainly shown up in business costs. We've seen some really high inflation. Uh, we usually look at inflation in year-over-year -year terms, but in this chart, for uh, reasons that you're about to see, we're looking at it in month-over-month -month terms. So if month-over-month -month inflation is usually between 0.2 and 0.3, you can see where we had uh, dramatically higher inflation in the month of uh, April, May, and June. And the reason that we use the colors here is, is sort of obvious uh, that a lot of that inflation was concentrated in air, airfares, hotels, admissions to events, then also new and used vehicles, some other physical goods as well. But you can see how much of it comes from those categories. Those categories are incredibly small in the overall consumer index. Each of them, the, the orange and yellows, are less than a percent of this uh, uh, virtual shopping basket or cart, if you will, even though they're less than 1% or uh, one of them is one and a half, less than 2% of the overall basket, during the reopening, airfares and hotels grew at 8, 9, 10% for those three months. Now, they were digging out of a hole, but those kind of month over month changes, which eventually they, they're representing uh, annualized increases of more than 100%, that's how you get something that's even a tiny part of your basket contributing to such high inflation. Same with uh, new and used cars. The semiconductor challenges in the manufacturing has really challenged that. So we get, uh, we, we get some strong inflation there. You can see where that's already stepped back in July. And this is very important when we think about interest rates and the Federal Reserve and inflation. We've already had that step down in July. And our view is that we're gonna have slower inflation as we go forward. Uh, this is encapsulating some of those categories, but an important thing, Nick and I were talking about this uh, late yesterday and early this morning, is on commodities. Any of you who are businesses who are paying for physical commodities, uh, you know the prices are through the roof over the past year. Um, metals like uh, copper and nickel and aluminum, uh, any kind of those raw goods, any kind of commodities have been through the roof. And that plays through to this inflation as well. Well, those have finally uh, topped out, it appears to us, and have turned back down over the past three months. Commodity, uh, excluding oil, excluding oil, but all other commodities as a basket are actually in negative territory over the next three months. Um, that comes from one on the supply side, 
It looks like the supply chain issues are being worked through. Uh, semiconductors are a little bit special. It takes a really long time for that, for that uh, sector to adjust. Uh, but most other supply chains was really starting to increase the supply there. And then also on the demand side, um, when we were buying lots of patios and decks and uh, Pelotons and everything, that really drove up the, the demand side for, for physical goods. And as I said earlier, those are starting to, to come down now and to decelerate. So our view is that we are going to have some deceleration of inflation, and we're not going to be in a situation where the Fed finds itself needing to hike very quickly, even though they are going to make some changes later this year, we believe. They're not in a situation where they're going to need to hike very quickly. Uh, I'm going to close out with uh, just a, a comment about longer-term interest rates, and that's the chart that's on the left here, the U.S. 10-year yield. Uh, and it clearly has been through a wild ride, the big decline last year. Uh, early this year, starting in January, moving up very sharply, getting up to 1.7% or so. And then any of you who are looking at interest rates because you've got an interest in uh, financing something or you're thinking about short-term uh, variable rates and longer-term fixed rates, you know that the, the interest rates moved down again over the past couple of months. Uh, I think at the end of the day yesterday, about 1.3% on the 10-year on the yield. Our view, because of something that I'll, I'll skip over for now about the Federal Reserve starting to step back their purchases, but when we get that uh, sort of slower but more reliable inflation, a view that the Fed will eventually normalize, uh, you can see that sort of gray band there is our view is that uh, longer term interest rates will be moving up again, but that they'll still be relatively low compared to history, compared to 2018 or even kind of returning to where we were just pre-pandemic right around 2%. I'm happy to answer any questions that we uh, that, that come up after that. I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing what Anabon says and, and the questions that all of you have. Uh, but I'll just I'll just finish by saying what what we said at the start. We have a positive view of the economy. Um, we clearly have some some labor issues and some inflation issues uh, to work out. But we think that the consumer will continue to spend uh, and recover, and we think that capex is going to pick up as well. So, Amy, I am going to stop right there and hopefully did not overstep my bounds in terms of time. No, certainly not at all. And actually, Luke, we do have a question in, and, and I'll ask it now. Uh, do you think the recent stimulus packages prove Keynesian economics works, or is it too early to tell? I'm sorry, could you say the, the did they prove what, Amy? I'm sorry. Keynesian economics? Oh, uh, did they prove that it works? So um, I'm not going to evaluate the policies like uh, from a political uh, level, but I will say that we know within the um, within the the world of economics that um, you can get into bad cycles uh, where if something goes down, then it'll continue down, and one thing feeds into another. That's how an economy works, right? Uh, it's an engine with a whole bunch of pieces that are all coming together and sort of need to be all working together. And uh, the pandemic was a clear and obvious disruption to that. So fiscal policy in the sense of stepping in to do something about that, uh, I think it was critical. And I think we'd be in much worse shape right now had it not been for the fiscal stimulus, uh, both to businesses and uh, the PPP program for small businesses. Of course, M&T was a, a major player there. Uh, and that really kept businesses afloat, and it also kept consumers afloat, and it stopped sort of what could have been a much worse downward cycle. Um, I'm not endorsing uh, the size, the nature, the structure of any particular policy, but what we did was to stop things from going down. And I'm also not saying that any of the more recent packages uh, aren't without cost, right? Economics is uh, there's always a benefit, but there's always a cost, and we're clearly facing some of those challenges with um, people not returning to, to work right now, not everybody, but there's some of not returning to work with the generous unemployment in, insurance benefits. Uh, you've also got some other challenges. We might have inflation from the fiscal policy. So there are downsides too. Uh, but Amy, you should know I give long answers to short questions. The short answer is uh, <laughs> yes, I think that it, it was certainly helpful, uh, but there are some other considerations as well. Okay, I actually have two other questions for you. Um, one is, can you... Um, Hold on, let me read. Uh, if the impact of higher minimum wages leading to higher consumer prices is really expected to come back down, or, or are we looking at what is effectively a new normal for uh, minimum wages and prices for consumer goods? 
Yeah, so and those two things are connected, but they're not in lockstep with one another. Uh, higher minimum wages is a, is a, was a big issue even before the pandemic, and um, and clearly uh, is going to have an impact for m some sectors more than others. And so instead of uh, stepping into the details of that and not wanting to take uh, too much time, let's just think about where wages are right now. Even without minimum wages, with a shortage of labor right now for multiple reasons. There's been a lot of retirement. You've got the unemployment insurance benefits. You've got a lot of people who are not returning because of inability to get to work with transportation or because they're taking care of kids at home. We've seen wages surge uh, in mostly all sectors. And it's not yet really playing through to that higher inflation. I think most of the higher inflation that we've seen so far has been because of those commodity short shortages, which I said are easing and then also because of the reopening in the spring. But something that we have to pay incredibly close attention to goes right to the, the thrust of this very good question is, are those higher wages gonna play through to higher, uh, higher uh, inflation? We think inflation will be higher over the next five to 10 years than it was over the previous five to 10 years. It was actually really low from say 2010 to 2019. Um, and minimum wages, if those issues come back up, could play a part too, but we think it's more uh, it's more targeted towards uh, businesses, their ability to become more productive, the lingering effects of those savings, uh, and then some federal policy uh, minutia that I won't get into right now, I mean. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and also I remind people to type your questions into the Q&A portion and we'll, we'll ask them. We do have a Q&A um, time scheduled at the end um, after Honorbon. So uh, I wanna move on. And um, our next spotlight feature um, is on TriGas and Oil, family owned for more than 58 years. TriGas and Oil is a petroleum propane marketer headquartered in Federalsburg. Nash McMahon is a third generation owner who graduated from Towson State University in 1994 with a major in economics. And then just a few years later, devoted himself full time to the family business and today serves as the company's president. He and his wife, Melanie, are lifetime residents of Caroline County, residing in Williston with their two children, Brennan and Rylan. Um, Nash is having some uh, video issues this morning, so he'll just be joining us by audio, but um, please welcome longtime friend and chamber partner, Nash McMahon. Thank you, Amy. Really do appreciate it and uh, wanna welcome everyone that's here with us. Looks like we're up to 162 participants, which is fantastic. And really do hope next year we'll be able to see each other in person, like you said earlier, Amy. Uh, again, I am sorry for our video issues that we're experiencing. And if we had video today, you would uh, you would see you're, you're in our conference room here in Federalsburg. With me today is my father, Keith McMahon. He's our chairman and CEO. Good morning, everyone. And we also have with us today our CFO, Mr. Dennis Vaught. Good morning, everybody. So it is an honor to support this event. Amy, congratulations on your second year uh, 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 taking care of this event and carrying on a wonderful tradition and a tradition that we are proud to be part of. Uh, we're, we're, we're honored to be able to do this with, uh, with our co-host, uh, uh, M&T Bank, great friends to the community and, and, uh, and truly have that feel of a community bank. And we also thank the, uh, you know, the folks over at Talbot County Economic uh, Support. Um, thank you, Luke for filling the shoes of Gary Keith. He would be very proud of what you've done today. And uh, we're glad to have you on board. And it's, uh, it's also a pleasure to hear your remarks. And it's also my honor to introduce our next speaker. Mr. Anabon Basu is the chairman and CEO of the Sage Policy Group. It's an economics and policy consulting firm that's headquartered right here in Baltimore. He also has an office in Indonesia. The firm of his provides strategic analytical services to the energy world, to law firms, to medical systems, to government agencies, and also real estate developers. Mr. Basu lectures right here at John Hopkins University in global strategy, and he's also taught international economics, urban economics, micro and macro economics at Hopkins. He can be heard weekdays on 88.1 FM, which is a local station in Baltimore. Uh, Mr. Basu earned his uh, BS and Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He has a master's in public policy from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and a master's in economics from the University of Maryland College Park. 
His Juris Doctor was earned at the University of Maryland School of Law. And he also did his doctoral work in health economics, and that took place at UMBC. Anabon, welcome back. Look forward to your presentation. Many thanks. Many thanks to the Trigas um, uh, and Oil family. Uh, Trigas and Oil, uh, serving the Delmarva for more than three generations with excellence. By the way, if you go to their website, uh, trigas-oil.com, you'll see that their logo is blue and red, red and blue, really. It's more red, and so I wore a red and blue tie today in honor of Troy Gas uh, and Oil. And so um, thank you very much for the invitation. Obviously, Luke Tilly is a hard act to follow. You'll see him all the time on things like CNBC, so on and so forth, a nationally regarded economist. I'm going to do my best for you. I'll, like him, try to spend between 20 and 30 minutes on this material. Uh, I hope you can see it. I'm trying to share my screen here. So if you can't see it, please tell me. But uh, my presentation today is entitled Ani Basu and the Chamber of Data. This is a Harry Potter themed presentation. You'll see that theming throughout this morning and then we'll jump right into uh, Q&A. And so let me begin. Uh, obviously it is still the case that the number one factor shaping economic outcomes uh, is COVID-19. Uh, and thanks to this uh, stubborn Delta variant in particular, we, in some cases, remain prisoners of our homes. Not completely, not like we were, let's say, uh, in March and April of last year. That's true. Nonetheless, aren't we doing this remotely? Weren't we supposed to do this in person? Yes, we were. And so those behavioral shifts, uh, those changes in how we engage the world, obviously have economic consequences. And one of the things I want to talk about are the economic consequences that we can measure in the data. So as I say, not every American family, of course, looks like this, some do, some don't. Uh, but the point is a shared global experience, a shared public health crisis, lots of behavioral changes during the crisis. And one of the things we wanna talk about probably this morning, and I think will help businesses here, uh, is to try to differentiate between those behavioral shifts that are permanent and those that are temporary and merely related to the pandemic itself. Uh, and I think uh, as it turns out, a fair, uh, amount or fair proportion of the behavioral shifts that we've seen during the pandemic have some permanence to them, but I'll talk more about this as I go through the presentation. This is gross domestic product. Uh, I don't want to try too much on the territory that Luke Tilly has already covered, though you'll find between our two presentations, precious little overlap. Um, so uh, there are two colors of bars here, blue and red, which by the way is also uh, uh, the, the, the colors of uh, Trigas and Oil's logo in any case, the blue colored bars are indexed to the left-hand axis. This is quarterly gross domestic product. The red colored bars are indexed to the right-hand uh, axis. Uh, you'll remember that we entered 2020 last year with lots of momentum. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when we met in, in later 2019, late 2019 to talk about the economy, both Gary and I were pretty optimistic about where the economy was headed, but we didn't know about the pandemic, but we had momentum. But that momentum ends uh, during that first quarter of 2020. So the red color bars are indexed to the right-hand axis. <laughs> and the first, sorry. Yeah. If I, if I can interrupt real quickly. So it, it looks like the screen you're sharing is um, not maybe oh. full screen. Yeah, so let me try to stop share and let me start try sharing again. I don't know why that's happened. Uh, it just looks compressed maybe. Is that it? Is that better? Uh, hold on, it hasn't come up. It says you're starting. There you go. You're good. Is that good? Okay, good. So, so red colored bars to the right-hand axis. So the first, thank you for that, by the way, uh, Amy. So the first um, red colored bar, as I say, is the first quarter of 2021. Uh, and that's when you know we shut down the economy. So we had momentum in January of 2020 into February of 2020. But then we shut down the economy in March of 2020. And that month is so bad for the economy that despite that pre-existing momentum, it takes the entire quarter down with it. During the first quarter of 2020, the U.S. economy shrinks 5% on an annualized basis. Now, that's big news by itself. For the fourth quarter of 2008, which had been the worst quarter of our economic lives, the U.S. economy shrank 8.4%. Um, so negative 5% print for a single quarter is a big deal. And again, that's on an annualized basis. But that was merely the appetizer this time around. For during the second quarter of 2020, the U.S. economy shrinks 31.4%. And around that time, there was this raging debate in the economics community about what the initial phase of recovery might look like. Would it be U-shaped, L-shaped, Nike swoosh, checkmark, square root, hockey stick? It was a straight-up V. 
But during the third quarter of last year, the U.S. economy comes back 33.4%. Now, by the end of last year, the fourth quarter, and I'll talk about why this happened, we start to lose momentum. Stimulus is injected into the economy on December 27th of 2020, then again on March 11th of the current year. Uh, and growth has picked up ever since, uh, culminating with the second quarter performance of 6.6%. Nonetheless, despite the fact that it has been a sharp recovery, gross domestic product is only about 0.8% above what it was pre-pandemic. And last year, if you look at last calendar year, the U.S. economy shrank 3.5%. And there are lots of implications to a shrunken economy. Let's talk about some of them. And let's begin with the discussion of the US labor market. So this next slide has the same kind of setup, blue colored bars and red colored bars, except now this is monthly job change in America, monthly job change in America. So the last blue colored bar here is February of 2020, February of 2020. It's a month during which America added 289,000 jobs. We had that momentum coming into last year. Um, now, the first red colored bar, and the red colored bars are next to the right-hand axis. I had to bifurcate the vertical axis, which sounds and is excruciatingly painful, but I had to do it for reasons I'll explain in just a moment. But the first red colored bar is March of 2020. And in March of 2020, as we shut down the economy, America loses 1.7 million jobs. But that's misleading. Uh, because the so-called reference week, uh, the week in which the underlying survey was conducted of establishments, was relatively early in March. So quite a few of the jobs lost in March didn't show up in the March jobs report. They would show up in the April jobs report, along with some of the jobs lost in April. And in April, America loses 20.7 million jobs. Now, February of 2020, again, going back to the pre-pandemic crisis, February of 2020 represented the culmination of a 113-month period during which America added jobs almost each and every month with no exception, except one, February of 2019. And during that 113 month period, America added 22 million jobs. We drove the official rate of unemployment down to three and a half percent. Well, that was a 50 year low. You'd have to go back to December of 1969 to find unemployment as low as it had been uh, pre-crisis. And just to give you a sense of how long ago that was, the Orioles were good back then. It was a long time ago. Orioles have won 41 games so far this year. In any case, um, we, we lost 22 million jobs, a bit more than that, between March and April of 2020. We gave it all back. You know, all those years of economic progress after the global financial crisis. Now, we've been adding jobs pretty much ever since, with the exception of December of last year. And the last couple of months have been quite strong. In June and July, we added more than 900,000 jobs. The issue hasn't been so much that. For many business people here, the issue has been I can't fill my available job openings fast enough. And this is, as Luke had mentioned, particularly true for those retailers, people in leisure and hospitality, meaning hotels and restaurants, but we'll talk more about the labor market going forward. Now, don't, please don't get me wrong. Though I will characterize the initial phase of recovery as V-shaped, we're not back. We're back in terms of gross domestic product, but along many other dimensions, we're not back. I'll give you an example. Number of jobs supported by the economy in America. If you compare February 2020 employment versus July of 2021. So why that period? February of 2020 is before the economy falls apart, starts to fall apart really in March. Uh, February 2020 is actually when the recession began officially, but the economy in, in many uh, ways held its own in February. It was really in March that the economy absolutely fell apart. And then July of 2021 is the last month for two of these data. So this is a 17 month comparison period that you'll see repeatedly. We're down 5.7 million jobs over those 17 months. So we're not back yet. Um, and the number one sector losing jobs, you can see from these horizontal bars, is leisure and hospitality. So again, that's by and large your restaurant and your hotel worker. Obviously, restaurants and hotels very much affected by these social distancing mandates that we saw last year. And it is still the case uh, because of the Delta variant that many restaurants are not operating as they normally would be. And many patrons are not going to them as they normally would. Uh, you know, they might be engaging in takeout of these kinds of things. Again, these are some of the behavioral shifts that we have seen, curbside pick up these kinds of things. Um, and the question becomes, will that continue after the pandemic? We'll have a chance to address those things if you want to during Q&A. Maryland, between February of 2020 and July of 2021, our state lost 118,300 jobs. Now, just to put that into perspective, during a decent year in Maryland, we had about 40,000 jobs. During a decent year, 40,000 jobs. 
So to lose 118,300 jobs, that's a big deal. That means that 4.3% of our pre-existing base of employment is gone. Now, the number one sector losing jobs here, again, leisure and hospitality, that's your restaurant and hotel worker, uh, by and large, that lost their jobs. Um, Maryland is a wealthy state. We're a wealthy state. You know, by in many measures, we have the highest median household income in America. We should be proud of that. But um, because of that, we have more discretionary income to spend on things like restaurants, for instance. So we have a big restaurant sector. Um, and, and therefore, when we shut, shut down the economy, we, as a proportion of the overall economic base, lost a lot of restaurant jobs. And you can see that somewhat reflected here. Indeed, while the nation lost 3.7% of its jobs during this period, we lost 4.3% of ours. And some of that has to do with this economic structure we have coming into the pandemic. Baltimore Metro, losing 3.2% of its employment, not as big a leisure hospitality segment in Baltimore. Uh, and so this region actually held up reasonably well, massive medical research component. So the Baltimore region was one of the better performers during this crisis period. Uh, Washington Metro losing 4.2% of its jobs. So Washington Metro lost more jobs as a fraction of its pre-existing base of employment than Baltimore. That might surprise you. Say, Adi Bond, Washington has all those uh, federal government workers, all those that agency, that stable agency employment, true. But Washington also has a massive leisure and hospitality sector even more hotels, even more restaurants. And disproportionately, those restaurants and hotels depend upon global travel. And of course, global leisure travel in particular was almost completely shut down by the pandemic. So Washington actually fared worse because again of that economic structure. This puts things in more regional perspective from a, or, or more of a national perspective, though it's the regional data. This is employment growth for the 25 largest metropolitan areas in America. Employment growth. Again, that comparison period, February 2020 to July of 2021. Now, this is a mistitled slide, that's for sure. There's no employment growth here. Every one of the nation's 25 largest metropolitan areas lost jobs during the 70th month period, but some regions held on to more of their pre existing base of employment than others. Let's cherry pick some. Uh, so, Denver, of course, Denver is booming. Lots of people moving in, whether from California or other places, lots of young people. And it's easier to social distance in Denver because that metropolitan area is a bit more spread out than some others. But then at number two, Dallas and San Antonio. So, who's the governor of Texas? Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott has been one of these governors, much in the news recently, as it turns out. But Greg Abbott, one of these governors, very aggressive in keeping that state's economy open, even during the worst of the crisis. Again, like Luke, I'm not here to advocate for particular policies. But some governors more, fo more, more focused on the economic and employment outcomes. For instance, at number four is Tampa. That's Florida. That's Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida. Very aggressive in keeping that economy open. At number five is Phoenix. That's Governor Doug Ducey of Arizona. Very aggressive. At number seven is Atlanta. That's Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia. The first to reopen his economy happened on April 20th of last year. So some of these governors were very focused on the employment and economic outcomes, wanted to retain as much normalcy as was possible, other governors more, were more focused on the public health uh, implications of the crisis. Now, if you look toward the bottom of the second column, you'll see the regions that lost the most jobs as a fraction of their pre-existing base of employment. And at number 25 is Orlando. And you say, Anibon, sir, we get it. It's morning. It's early. You don't have your stuff together here. Uh, Orlando is in Florida, Anibon. And that's Governor Ron DeSantis. Same state, same governor. What gives? What gives, of course, is the structure of the Orlando metropolitan area economy, which is about theme parks, leisure and hospitality, retail trade. It's about in-person experience, not about remote work, for instance. But look at number 23 and number 24, San Francisco and Los Angeles. Who's the governor of California? Why, it's the wickedly handsome Gavin Newsom. Himself could be a Hollywood actor. Very aggressive in keeping that economy shut down. In fact, he was the last to reopen his economy. At number 22, New York. Now, as of a few days ago, the governor there, of course, was Andrew Cuomo. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, again, very aggressive in keeping that economy shut down. And remember, the, some of the major California markets, as well as New York City, were early stage viral epicenters. So policymakers there felt the need to respond as infection was spreading very, very quickly early during the pandemic. At number 21 is San Diego. Again, that's Governor Newsom of California. Unemployment, we're back down to 5.4% unemployment. Um, we were at 14.8% in April of 2020. That's the big peak you see here. I won't go through too much of this slide. I just want to point out one thing. I'm offering you some additional granularity here. 
during the previous economic downturn, the so-called Great Recession, men suffered relatively more because of massive job losses in manufacturing and construction. But this recession was much more about services, uh, things like salons and daycare centers, private schools, uh, home health, leisure and hospitality. Uh, and so a lot of female-dominated occupation categories were implicated by that. And so women, sort of the early stage of the pandemic, fared much worse. So back in April of 2020, while the overall rate of unemployment was around 14.8%, for women that month, it was over 16%, according to the initial estimates. Uh, this is unemployment for those same 25 major metropolitan areas, just to give you some sense of where Washington metro is and Baltimore metro is, as of July, 5.1% and 5.4% respectively. Again, the national rate of unemployment down to 5.4%. Um, at number one, here's Atlanta, lowest unemployment rate. Governor Brian Kemp at number 25 is Los Angeles. Governor Gavin Newsom. So policy clearly, I think, made a difference. Maryland unemployment rates, 24 major jurisdictions. Again, July of 2021, you can see Talbot County there now with an unemployment rate less than 5%. And you'll see that there are a number uh, of, uh, of jurisdictions in the state uh, with unemployment less than 5%. Many of them tend to be suburban counties, as it turns out, like your Howard County, Queen Anne County, Carroll County, so on and so forth. Some are more rural in nature, like St. Mary's or Talbot, but uh, you know, very good news to see. The highest unemployment rates, as it turns out, uh, in Baltimore City and Prince George's County, still stubbornly above 7%. Let's, let's do, drill a little bit deeper into Talbot County, shall we? So this is Talbot County unemployment over time. 19 years of data, you can see that there was a time during which unemployment in Talbot County was above 10% during this crisis. What do we know about Talbot County? Lots of restaurants, lots of places to stay. You know, the Tidewater and so on and so forth, really beautiful places. Uh, it, it is a tourist hub, you know, St. Michael's and Easton as examples. Uh, attract a lot of tourism, but that basically was shut down. So th that part of the economy really got uh, hard hit. Uh, you can see here lots of problems. Unemployment is still meaningfully above where it was pre-pandemic, as it turns out. It was less than 4% pre-pandemic, but nonetheless, you can see the progress that's been rendered. Let's keep going here with some of the implications of uh, the pandemic. And let me talk a little bit about public policy. Again, here, there is some overlap with what Luke suggested or indicated, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's worthwhile to go through some of this material. So if you're familiar with the Harry Potter books and movies, you know that the, uh, the government of witches and wizards is known as the Ministry of Magic. Uh, very powerful, the Ministry of Magic. Uh, now, I don't know how much magic comes out of Washington, DC. I can tell you that a lot of dollars did last year, and Luke mentioned this, just to provide a bit more detail around this, or another form of detail. Three major stimulus packages passed last year uh, and signed by then President Donald Trump. The first was signed by him on March 27th, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security, or CARES Act, this is a $2.2 trillion package that becomes the model for all subsequent packages. Uh, less than a month later, more money is added into the Paycheck Protection Program and also more money for healthcare delivery. That, was, that happened in April of last year. And then for many months after April of last year, no major stimulus was injected into the economy. By that point, the summer of uh, 2020, for example, we're adding millions of jobs. So, you know, we added 2.8 million jobs in May. 4.8 million jobs in June of last year, 1.7 million uh, in July, 1.6 million in August, 716,000 in September of last year. Again, that V-shaped recovery. So that's where we were. But that stimulus that had been injected into the economy during the spring of 2020 works its way through the economy and starts to fade in terms of impact. And so by December of last year, we're losing jobs. Retail sales start to struggle in October of last year. So since that the economy is falling apart, Congress legislates, and then the president signs on uh, December 27th, nine months after he signs the CARES Act, he signs the Consolidated Appropriations Act, a $906 billion package, more direct payments to Americans, more extended and enhanced unemployment insurance, loans and grants to businesses, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, all this news has been trumped by the latest stimulus package. Uh, this was signed by uh, Joe Biden on March uh, 11th. This is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. This is a $1.9 trillion package. More direct payments to Americans. I think a lot of Americans like direct payments. Um, more extended and enhanced uh, unemployment insurance benefits from the federal government, which will linger for just a few more days, as it uh, uh, turns out. September 6th is the expiration date on that. Um, but this package included something different. It included direct aid 
to state and local government of $350 billion. Now, please don't get me wrong. There was a lot of money that flowed from federal coffers to state and local government coffers in 2020. But this was more in the nature of general fund relief. You know, fewer strings attached to these monies. The monies that came out of the federal government in 2020 were designated monies, you know, specified for particular reasons. For instance, the purchase of uh, personal protective equipment, those kinds of things, ventilators, intensive care unit beds, those kinds of things to bulk up healthcare delivery capacity. This is, again, more in the nature of general fund relief. And you might remember on Capitol Hill, there was this raging debate about why we might not want to do this. You remember that? We don't want to bail out states like New Jersey and Illinois. Do you remember that statement? We don't want to bail out New Jersey and Illinois. As it turns out, in America, we have a fair amount of antipathy for people from New Jersey and Illinois, which I find to be perfectly preposterous, as those are most wonderful people, at least those folks from Illinois. More uh, money here for small businesses, public health, so on and so forth. Now, you can ask the question, are we being Dumbledore? So Albus Dumbledore, of course, the headmaster of Hogwarts School, Hogwarts made famous by the Harry Potter books and movies. We entered the crisis with a $23.5 trillion national debt. As this chart suggests, we are screaming towards $30 trillion. Um, and so, you know, I was taught in economics, there's no free lunch. I think Luke and his answer to a question was trying to get at this, which is that there is benefit and there is cost to these policies. The benefit was short-term in orientation. It kept the economy together more than it otherwise would have been. I mean, our economy shrank 3.5% last year. The Mexican economy shrank more than 8%. The Canadian economy more than 5%. The English economy shrank about 10%. You know, the Spanish economy shrank 11%. So because of all that stimulus, we reduced or suppressed some of the pain we otherwise would have felt, but no free lunch in economics. And so at some point, I presume, we're going to pay for this. If not, if not literally pay it back, then in some other way, a bond market crisis, financial crisis, whatever it happens to be, we're going to pay the piper for having done this, but I don't think that's a 2021 or 2022 issue. So let's keep moving on to another aspect of economic life. So Luke mentioned correctly that we spent a lot of money on goods last year, right? We couldn't go to a ballpark and spend $9 on a hot dog. We couldn't take a vacation to Hawaii, whatever it happens to be. And so we ended up buying a lot of stuff. And yet, despite that, a bunch of retailers went bankrupt last year. Here's a list of some of the major retailers who went bankrupt in 2020. So back in February of last year, Pier 1 Imports um, goes bankrupt, closes all of its stores. They can still buy their merchandise online. Then in April, True Religion, the supplier of those most excellent jeans uh, that make everyone look slender, they go bankrupt that month. Then J. Crew, New York Marcus, J.C. Penny go bankrupt in May. Do you remember that? Then GNC. GNC, which sells those supplements that many of us take to build up our health, um, to build up our musculature. I pop those pills like crazy. Uh, I still have the arms of an accountant for every reason. Brooks Brothers goes bankrupt uh, uh, in July. Lord & Taylor, that Howard department store, goes bankrupt in August. And then Francesca's, which is a, a clothing retailer, they go bankrupt uh, in December. So, but, but again, here's the thing. As Luke pointed out correctly, we ended up buying a lot of stuff last year, huge retail sales. True, there was a moment of weakness in retail sales. And it starts in February of 2020. Remember February of 2020, by this point, you and I have heard about COVID-19. Um, some people are beginning to withdraw from the economy, at least partially, for fear of infection, for fear of the unknown. And again, that's when the recession's day to have begun by the National Bureau of Economic Research's Business Cycle Dating Committee. But then things fall off the table. If you look at this chart toward the right-hand side in March and April of last year, but what do you see here, ladies and gentlemen? Again, you see that V-shaped recovery. By June of 2020, retail sales are above their pre-recession peak. You can see more recently that retail sales have basically been at all-time highs. True, July was weaker than June. And, you know, Luke mentioned that as well. But, you know, looking from the historical perspective, July was still quite strong. So how do we reconcile all this spending on retail items with all that retail bankruptcy? Well, there were some shifts in what we bought and how we bought it. This is U.S. retail sales by type of store. Again, the comparison period is February of 2020 to July of 2021. And these horizontal bars represent the percentage change in retail sales over that 17-month period. So at the very top is a category called sporting goods, hobby, book, and music stores. That's a brick and mortar category. What's that about? Well, as Luke pointed out, that's about the sale of Peloton bikes and other exercise equipment. You know, we structured our homes to deal with the pandemic. We were spending a lot of time at home. Couldn't go to the gym, brought the gym to the house. 
And number two is the internet. That's e-commerce, that e-commerce boom. We spent a lot online, obviously. You know, that includes Amazon, for instance. Jeff Bezos you know, had a really good year last year, not romantically, but in terms of business, you know, it picked up 500,000 associates last year. Now, if you look at the very bottom here, where do we suffer the most? Food services and drinking places. Food services and drinking places. That's a fancy way of saying restaurants and bars. So most human beings call that restaurant bars, restaurants and bars. We, we economists call that food services and drinking places, which is one of the many reasons many of us have never been on a date. And then clothing, clothing, accessory stores, a few categories from that. Early in the crisis, we were not buying clothes. Why? We were not going outdoors. Who are we trying to impress? Our families know what we look like. There's no hiding that from them. Uh, and so that lines up neatly with the bankruptcies of your J. Crew and Neiman Marcus and others that depend upon apparel sales. Restaurants, this green squiggly line represents the percentage change in restaurant reservations vis-a-vis -vis the same day in 2019. Now, if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, you can see in March and April of last year, we go to negative 100%. Now, my staff in Baltimore created this slide on my behalf. They're mostly in their 20s and 30s. Uh, and they took the vertical axis down to negative 120%. And I need to tell them once you get back into the office that the most you can go down is negative 100%. But please set that aside. That is an internal staffing issue. Now, you can see we start to rebound in May into June. But it, it is inconsistent recovery. You know, we, you know, we start to move back to 2019 levels and then we fade away. Why? Well, four major um, surges in virus infection. So the first one was March and April of last year. Then we had the summer surge, Florida, Georgia, Arizona, Texas, Southern California. Then we had the surge in infections after Labor Day. Then we had the surge in infections early, earlier this year, which was actually the worst surge. And now we have the Delta variant surge. So we just have not been able to consistently recover. That said, if you look at the most recent data, we're basically back to 2019 levels. That's a good sign. Uh, let me, I have about uh, you know, six to, uh, to eight more minutes of, of speech and then we'll go to Q&A. So uh, I just wanna talk about another aspect of economic life, housing and real estate. So again, if you're familiar with the Harry Potter books and movies, uh, you know that every student admitted into Hogwarts is allocated to one of four houses. Uh, there is Hufflepuff, there is Gryffindor. In fact, uh, Harry Potter and his two best friends, Hermione Granger and Ronald Weasley are members of Gryffindor. I'm from Baltimore. So every wizard from Baltimore is allocated into Ravenclaw. It's just a rule. I'm just, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just telling you what it is. Uh, there's some other rules out there. So if you're from Pittsburgh, you end up in Slytherin. Yeah, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just telling you what it is. Now, one of the other aspects of economic life, of course, is that interest rates plummeted. Here I'm showing you two interest rates of interest, the 15-year fixed mortgage rate in red and the 30-year fixed mortgage rate in blue. But I think you know that interest rates have been low. I don't think it would surprise any member of the chamber, any member of this esteemed audience, that home prices were rising prior to the crisis. Well, of course they were. The inventory of unsold homes was low. Mortgage rates were favorable prior to the onset of the public health crisis. Uh, economy was strong. Wage growth is strong. Confidence is high. I think it could be viewed as somewhat surprising that the pace of home price appreciation accelerated during the crisis. This is the S&P Case Shiller National. Uh, home price index. You can see here that spike in home prices. And some of you probably have benefited if you look at your own, you know, think about your own portfolio, think about your wealth profile. You know, many of us who came into this period with assets have done quite well in terms of our wealth profiles, haven't we? Our financial, the financial markets have surged higher. Uh, it, the S&P is up for seven straight months, for instance. Uh, the, uh, you know, home prices have, have risen. For those who did not enter this period with assets, problematic because homes are even more expensive. It makes uh, saving that down payment for home ownership that much more challenging. And they have not necessarily had a financial portfolio that is appreciated. So in any case, the haves have gained, the have nots in general have lost. And maybe we can explore that more during the Q&A. One of the things that that has done is it's triggered a supply side response. Now, as I approach the end of this presentation, I'm going to show you a set of leading economic indicators because I want to get to the forecast. Luke actually began his presentation with the forecast, which I think is very effective. I'll end my presentation with the forecast, but or my forecast. But uh, this is a leading indicator. This is U.S. residential building permits. And this is a leading indicator because if you're a builder, you've got to pull a permit before you build. So it reflects an intention to build. Now, the segment of interest here is the red segment. 
for purpose of our discussion here, because that relates to single unit structures, that's your townhomes or single family detached homes. And if you look at this, you can see that permits for single family homes are rising pre-pandemic, then they collapse a bit uh, because of a number of reasons, including the fact that government offices that issue such permits were not open for business fully to issue such permits. And then you can see here, permits took off. Now you might say to me, Anibhan, I noticed when I look at this red segment here for the end of your slide, that, um, that in fact, permits have been declining recently. Why is that? Two word answer, softwood lumber. I know that softwood lumber futures prices are still low, but softwood lumber, if you go out to buy it today, is still very expensive, along with gypsum and almost anything, concrete slabs that goes into the construction of a new home. And so that has limited the market's growth for now. Now, softwood lumber prices are starting to fall, have been falling. You'll see that more and more in the stores. Uh, you know, Luke mentioned that inflation is subsiding in many cases. Supply chains are catching up to demand uh, in more and more cases. And so I expect a lot of that inflation to be transitory as does he. And so you'll see this, this permit data start to come back. Even with this, the permits are, are, are still higher than they were pre-pandemic. One of the other aspects of life, massive migration to the suburbs. This is in millions. You see the red bar here? That's the 2 million people who moved out of principal cities last year. Could have been Chicago, New York, San Francisco. You see the blue bar here? That reflects the 3 million people who moved into suburbs. And of course, lots going on here, but remote work is one of them. Online shopping is another. Proximity lost value last year. What do I mean by that, proximity lost value? Ask yourself the question, why is Manhattan so expensive? Proximity. To what? Very deep labor market. Two largest central business districts in America are in Manhattan, that's Lower Manhattan, the financial district, and then Midtown. Uh, fabulous restaurants, fabulous nightlife, Central Park, Broadway, views of New Jersey, and Brooklyn. It's very glamorous. But proximity lost some value last year because in a world of remote work, online shopping, and streaming Netflix, proximity doesn't have quite the cachet that it once did. That's reflected in many different ways, including here, this apartment rents. See the, see the left-hand column here? That reflects the apartment rent declines sustained in several communities between March and December of last year. So what I'm trying to say here is that between March and December of last year, apartment rents in San Francisco fell 27%. And in Seattle, 22%. Boston, 21%. New York, 20%. Proximity lost value. Now, then rents can fall everywhere. Look at the right-hand column here. So one of the things that a lot of people are focused on is the fact that California lost population last year for the first time in 120 years. But a lot of the migration in California was inside the state. It was people moving from San Francisco to Fresno or Los Angeles to Bakersfield. So rents had declined in Fresno, for instance, or in El Paso, Texas, or some of the other markets. So many Americans not only moved from cities to suburbs, they moved from more expensive communities to less expensive communities. And that's something I think you'll continue to see with the world of remote work opening up where people can live. You can still have a job in Manhattan, but live outside of the New York metropolitan area. There's another way of looking at it. You see the dark purple line there? That's the rent or cumulative rental decline, cumulative rent decline sustained in principal cities over the 12 months of last year. See the light purple line there? That's suburban cities. So I'm from Baltimore. So our suburban cities are likes of Columbia, Ellicott City, Towson, Hunt Valley, White Marsh, Timonium, Hampstead, Westminster, Falston, Bel Air, Severna Park, Annapolis, Glen Burnie. I could go, I think I am. The point is, that's not where the rents are declining, because that's not where the population is leaving uh, from. Uh, and so you see this result. Finally, let me uh, wrap it up here with the crystal ball. The great rapper Rob Bass said, it takes two to make a thing go right. Uh, and, uh, and, and in economics, what are those two things? Demand and supply. And one of the things that we monitor, of course, uh, is confidence. So here's the University of Michigan's Index of Consumer Sentiment, and consumers are psychologically down in the dumps. But I could make the case that from a financial perspective, American households have never been in better shape. And, and, and why? Because of something Luke said, massive excess savings. Now, what does it mean, excess savings? Excess, excess savings, excess savings are, are defined as savings above and beyond what would have occurred but for the pandemic. As Luke mentioned, American households have amassed $3.1 trillion in excess savings over the course of this pandemic. Now, again, a lot of that, yes, savings is among higher income households. That's true. And of course, Talbot County has lots of higher income, very wealthy households, as it turns out. 
But uh, but still, in, in general, the U.S. savings rate has bumped higher, and those savings represent fuel that can be spent later on in 2022 and beyond. And that's one of the reasons to think that the private sector really will grow a lot next year because it'll be fueled by ongoing household spending. But again, psychologically, the consumer is not in a great place. And the same is true for small businesses in America. So if you're a small business operator and you're not that confident, understand you're not alone. This is the National Federation Independent Business Index of Small Business Optimism. Question, Small Business America, is it a good time to expand your business over the next three months? Well, you can see in July, only 13% of small business operators said yes to that question. So they're worried about workers, they can't find them. Those workers are becoming much more expensive, much more demanding, want much more flex time. Input costs have risen, whether you're you know, softwood lumber or other forms of inputs to production. And so it's difficult to feed money to the bottom line in this kind of environment, especially when the labor market is not fully complying. Uh, and, and people's expectations, worker expectations are just so much higher than they used to be with respect to both compensation and flexibility. And not every business can offer that. If for a lot of you businesses where people work in teams, you know, you can't have team members, you know, necessarily floating around uh, doing whatever it is they're doing. I mean, they might be able to work remotely together, but nonetheless, you need them engaged in the process. And a lot of people, again, want a lot of flexibility in terms of how they handle their time. Not great for teamwork, necessarily. So bottom line, bottom line here, for an economy to flourish, both demand and supply size, the economy must participate. The Biden administration is looking at ongoing stimulus. I understand the national debt is crashing towards $30 trillion that Social Security Trust Fund will go and solve it in 2034, Medicare Trust Fund in 2026, but still, more spending is afoot. So demand will continue to be stimulated, but supply continues to be constrained by these global supply chain disruptions, by COVID-19, so on and so forth. And that's translated to inflation, and I think some of these supply chain disruptions will persist well into 2022. And perhaps you've seen what's happening in China and uh, Southeast Asia right now, you know, the Chinese shut down a significant fraction of the third largest container port in, a, in the world because of one infection. So there's lots of interruptions out there. The result is that the U.S. savings rate will remain elevated, resulting or spring loading the economy for rapid economic growth once vaccines become even more broadly available globally, not just in the United States. And so you know, we've got to get through this Delta variant, which should peak, by the way, soon. You know, if we follow the trajectory of the United Kingdom, we should be peaking in terms of this Delta variant uh, case rate uh, sometime early in September, and we're now in early September. The back half of 2021 should have been spectacular for economic growth, but now only the fourth quarter of 2021 will. And again, I'm counting on that Delta variant to start to dissipate by that fourth quarter. But there will be a day of reckoning as deficit hawks come back to fashion one day. National debt is closing in on $30 trillion, no free lunch. Now, again, that's not a 2021 or 2022 issue, but something you should be worried about uh, as Talbot County stakeholders. Why? Because you're part of the state of Maryland. And Maryland's economy is driven disproportionately by the federal government. So the federal government has to cut spending or raise taxes at some point in the future. Maryland suffers disproportionately from those kinds of policies. In any case, I'll leave it at that. Let's go to q and I'll stop sharing at this time. Okay, thank you, Anurban. And uh, Luke, I'll invite you to uh, open your camera up. And, and I'm going to ask, we do have a couple of questions actually related to the um, labor market and any thoughts on how we see our way out of the labor crisis. I, I can tell you uh, at the chamber there, uh, we have a jobs opening uh, portion of our homepage on our website, and it's never had as many openings. We are uh, inundated with job openings and questions, uh, can you find me some employees and where do they go? What, what, what can we do to uh, find our way out of this? Yeah, see, I think one of the fears here, and of course I'll give it a look uh, in a moment, but one of the fears here is that we have changed culturally. That this is not about compensation levels. This is about something that's fundamentally changed in American culture. And, and, and things change from generation to generation. Baby boomers are notoriously hardworking. But many of them are now in their 70s. Uh, many of them are now in their 60s, and some have already retired. We saw a lot of retirement among baby boomers during the crisis. Some because their 401ks became very healthy and fat. Some because they lost a job early in the pandemic and they just gave up. But now we are depending on younger generations to satisfy labor market demands. And we've got millennials, and they have a different view of things. 
you know, and so uh, the, the, the chief economist at Manpower, I thought, said something very, very interesting. He said that from the perspective of job seekers, job seekers have become more like consumers. They're really picky about the jobs they're willing to take. Yes, they're looking at compensation, but they're looking at other things like flexibility. Can I work remotely? Um, social mission. And it's very difficult, I think, for employers to check all of the boxes these days. And so what happens? Jobs go unfilled. On the last day of June, we have 10.1 million available unfilled jobs in America. Easily a record. So it is a, it's a frustration. And I know that the uh, enhanced federal unemployment insurance benefits will lapse in a few days. But there are other factors, I think, that are shaping labor force dynamics. And none of them necessarily benefit employers. Final point. Workforce development agencies around the country spent a lot of money during the crisis investing a lot in helping people uh, elevate their skills during the pandemic. And a lot of the people who were in those programs worked in things like retail trade, leisure and hospitality. But now they're looking for jobs in other sectors, which is probably one of the reasons that a lot of retailers, hoteliers and restaurateurs can't find workforce right now. So I agree with uh, everything that Audubon said, and I'm going to try to not uh, add too much to it, but uh, reinforce a couple of things. One, the 401k and the retirement issue is huge, and it really cannot be overstated because they've got healthy 401ks. And if we compare that to the previous uh, uh, re recession, um, you know, the S&P 500 peaked in 2007. When did it recover its previous peak? 2013, you know, some six years later. Now, not everybody's 401k, especially at retirement age, is going to be heavily weighted towards the S&P 500, but, but it gives the idea that it took a lot longer. And back then, when Anabon and I were talking to people, we were talking about a logjam of people who were not retiring, and it was creating problems for uh, kids who are graduating from school and looking for jobs. And basically, we've got the inverse of that right now, where when we look at the uh, somewhere around 2 million people who have left the labor force, a lot of them have retired. And it's for those reasons. Um, and the, the social aspect that Annabon is talking about is, is really important as well. It's um, people who want different aspects of their job. It's also uh, there's a lot of people that I've talked to who, have, who um, are not going to go back. And there's a, there's a ton of households in our country that are two-person two working households. Uh, they've discovered one, that they could probably make it on one. They've discovered, and I've heard this, I actually like my kids and I wanna be home with them and be them with more often. I'm gonna be looking for part-time work. Uh, and I've seen that in, you don't, you don't get that in data, but you do get it in some survey data and a lot of anecdotal, um, a lot of anecdotal stories. And uh, another piece is that there has been a lot of, because of the retirement, because of people not going back, there's a lot of people shifting sectors. If there are companies and industries sitting there going, what happened to all of our employees? Oh, they're sitting there at home waiting for the unemployment insurance benefits to end. That's not necessarily true. The voluntary quits rate, people quitting their jobs over the past six months is at an all-time high as well. It is the people are voluntarily leaving their jobs. They cannot collect unemployment insurance if they do that. And they are shifting and they're going to other jobs. I've talked to uh, a legal firm that hired a paralegal, somebody, and they hired somebody who used to be in leisure and hospitality. And they said, you know what? This person doesn't have the skills to do it, but we're, we need to find somebody and we're going to train them again. That, em that employee said, I'm tired of standing on my feet. I realize that there's opportunities somewhere else. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I'll say, and this again reinforces something that Anubhan said, and he, Anubhan said, uh, you know, a few times, and this is incredibly important that these generous unemployment insurance benefits are ending in just a couple of days. We should not expect a massive wave of people just going back to work next week, next month, or over the next uh, couple of months because of that thing I said, uh, because of some of those things that we've mentioned. Um, the 25 states that have already uh, ceased doing those generous unemployment benefits over the course of the summer, they've had two months now. There's not a real perceptible level of job growth that has been much stronger in those states than the other 25 the other 25 do have a much bigger uh, portion of the labor force, but it has not been that much stronger in those 25 states. There is a perceptible, uh, statistically significant move of people going back into the labor force. So this is true that when the unemployment insurance benefits end, you'll see more people uh, re-entering the labor force. Uh, but I am not expecting, and it doesn't sound like Audubon is, a massive rush of people and all of a sudden we're back to normal uh, soon. There's going to be labor market tightness. And I think that that puts uh, even more importance on the ability of firms to do more with less people. And we know that that's a dynamic that has already happened. 
uh, and it's very challenging, but they're going to be forced to do it. It's something that usually happens, that, that uh, productivity growth is something that usually happens slowly and surely and then a little bit faster after recessions. That dynamic is on steroids right now, and it basically needs to be uh, because of this problem. I think the, the uh, question, some jobs may be gone forever. I think that it, we're going to con- just continue seeing this shift. So, yes, in fact, some may be gone forever. And uh, the employers are just going to continue uh, needing to um, pivot. Uh, I know the chamber is certainly doing more on less. And so, uh, as we all are. Uh, so, here I have another question. With the continued real estate market increasing for so many years, do you see a drastic decrease when people quote unquote, go back to normal, moving back to the city and downsizing? Uh, well, let me Auto start. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah uh, so, I, so, so I've heard so many people say to me, uh, I see these rising home prices. This feels a lot like 2003, 2004, 2005. It's another bubble forming, not so fast. You know, back then in 2003, 2004, 2005, as home prices were rising, we're also doing a few things. We were constructing a lot more homes then than we are now, A. And B, a lot of people were qualifying for mortgages that probably should not have qualified for mortgages. So you remember this was the period of the no document loan, so on and so forth. So we were, in some sense, fraudulently creating demand for homes. This time is different. As far as I can see, lending standards are still quite disciplined. Uh, and we're not building nearly as many new homes as we were back then. Uh, and so when I look at various communities, including in Talbot County, the inventory of household homes is extraordinarily low. And in many very nice neighborhoods, you'll find zero homes available for sale. And so demand is strong. There's some demographic support for that demand. The millennials are coming of age. That's our largest, most educated generation. Uh, and the supply is not there. And so you put that together, while I would expect that home price appreciation will slow markedly uh, over the next uh, year or two compared to what we've seen during the pandemic, for instance, uh, I would not expect prices to collapse. If prices do begin to fall, it's not because there's some kind of speculative bubble in place, it's simply because mortgage rates have risen uh, rapidly. Now, we haven't seen that yet, obviously, but if they were to, then you might see home prices fall. But I don't think that's indicative of a bubble or speculative bubble. That's indicative of just supply demand shifting with higher mortgage rates. And so uh, in any case, uh, this is very different from the situation, let's say uh, a couple of decades ago. Yeah, I I agree, Anavan. And um, uh, you know, first thing to say, and Anavan hinted towards this, some neighborhoods, some areas, every housing market is different, Uh, except for that period in 2004, five, six, seven, where it was an overbuilding almost everywhere you went. And even then it was more intense in certain areas. Every region, every area is gonna have its own independent market. Uh, nationally, and we can look across sort of like the major breakdowns, we've had, you know, what Anabon described, which is a big shift. We had a lot of people moving out uh, to get away from apartments, getting more elbow room because of the pandemic. And I think that that's um, a bit of a permanent shift, uh, but it has slowed significantly. You also have the underlying demographic factors uh, with people uh, aging in the demographics that Anabon mentioned. Almost everything that we look at with the housing market shows the post-pandemic blip uh, upward move, surge, a very strong move, and then coming back down, but stopping there. You know, the housing market is one that is notorious forever, has gone overbuilt too much, and then a big swing to the downside. Everything that we're looking at right now, whether it's um, permits for new housing, the starts of new housing, adjusting for availability of goods, uh, foot traffic for new, uh, for the National Association of Home Builders, the number of people who are coming and looking, they it shot up. Post-pandemic, during pandemic, it has come back down and it appears to be leveling out here. It's not the familiar, as Anaman said, up and then you have to go way down and experience years of pain in the sector. Um, I'm not here and saying or, you know, committing to that it couldn't happen, but all signs right now are we've had that blip. There's a little bit of a lag with building. And I agree with Anaman on the price effects. If you see prices change, it's probably more of a flattening out after, uh, after that, that boom. Uh, and it has a lot to do with mortgage rates. So mortgage rates are going uh, are going to determine that. I agree on a bond. So I do see one here: issues impacting the cost of raw materials and the corresponding increases at the retail level do not seem to affect spending. Your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, oh, I, go ahead, Luke. I've seen it affecting uh, spending. So, you know, Anaban is saying that lumber hasn't gone down. The futures have come down. The prices, not just on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but the prices um, 
at uh, actual uh, mills, uh, mills in the, the builders, you know, they're, they're seeing that those, those prices are coming down. It hasn't flowed through to the consumer just yet. Uh, it usually takes a couple of months in what we've seen for commodity prices to flow through to intermediate producers, final producers, and then the shelf. Uh, but we are seeing that weakness in commodities. When you look at all commodities, and I mentioned this a little bit, um, X Energy, it's down over the past three months. Commodity cycles, this commodity cycle, if you just looked at the levels, looks a lot like uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Massive boom, and then it moves down afterwards. And I think that the supply chain, uh, the, the, the familiar supply chain impacts that I had mentioned, which is <laughs> the best cure for high prices is high prices. People start making more of stuff, and they, and they come in um, and, and produce more, and that helps on the supply on the demand side moving down. The, the only real hitch here, the thing that could keep the prices higher is all of those excess savings that I talked about, consumers willing to buy. But in all of the, when you look across some um, sector by sector, some of those in, you know, Onovan does a good job of going sector by sector within retail sales or within, you know, some of those categories, the places that have had the biggest price increases are seeing a little bit of uh, a weakness or topping out. And some people are turning around and saying, no, it's, 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 uh, there are limits to everything. Um, and, it, you know, you can get into a redeal, really detailed discussion, but for me, what I'm looking at, it looks like a familiar cycle. Prices are going too high. People are buying less of those items. Uh, and that's one of the, that's the main reason I expect some relief on the inflation side. So I have a question I'm going to throw out here to you. Uh, what are the books and podcasts? What should we be reading? What should we be listening to? Yeah, so um, a great question. So I think the, uh, let me just say, the New York Times has a fabulous business section. I mean, the writers there are phenomenal, uh, including the ones who write about the economy. The Wall Street Journal, obviously, you know, great source of information. And what I'm talking about here is it's nice to get information that's not filtered purely through a political lens, you know, that's data driven. You know, you know, these are, ch you know, chamber members, they're business people, they're looking for objectivity. If they want subjectivity, they can turn on CNN or Fox. But if they want objectivity, then, um, you know, so The Economist magazine, is fabulous. It takes a week to read. It comes out once a week, as it turns out. But it is a fabulous source of information. There uh, is a uh, website, the uh, St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis has this data set, the FRED, they call it FRED. So any piece of data you want to find, it's so nicely organized, so nicely displayed in terms of what's happening with copper prices or labor force participation rate or whatever it is you're interested in any given moment. So those are some of the sources I go to uh, constantly. And also, by the way, Bloomberg Business, I think, is also quite excellent. Yeah, I agree. I looked for a podcast called The Wickedly Handsome Sorcerer uh, from Anuban Basu, but I haven't been able to uh, to find it yet. I'm hoping it'll be out there soon. Um, like Anuban, I, I, uh, I like The Economist a lot. I like the, the other ones that he mentioned. I like The Economist. Um, it's British. You have to get used to, you know, having a U in the word labor and color and, and, and that. But um, I think that they're fair. I think that they're uh, pretty balanced on both sides. And, you know, they've got a dedication to uh, markets work, prices work, but not overly to the sense of markets should handle everything. They recognize that there are inefficiencies in some markets. You know, the market for pizza and soda is not the same as the market for healthcare, uh, and that's where there should there there is likely to be better outcomes if there's if there's more government involvement, not owning it, but you know there are some things that uh, that require uh, more than just a supply and demand chart. So I find it really informative and. I know I realize that the questioner is probably asking about economics. The economist sections on books and arts uh, and science are fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And they are worth that second half of the week that Anuban is referring to. OK, um, we're going to do the time. We're going to wrap it up there. Um, I just want to uh, just quickly throw it to um, Cassandra Van Hooser to kind of say a few words, uh, wrap it up at the end here before we uh, Say goodbye. Thank you, Amy. And thank you all for joining us uh, this morning for this virtual presentation. The Talbot County Department of Economic Development and Tourism is proud to partner with the Talbot County Chamber of Commerce, m and Bank, and TriGas and Oil to bring you this program. Now, I had planned to quote English philosopher Francis Bacon, who coined the phrase, knowledge is power, but in honor of Audubon, I'm going to quote something Dumbledore said to Harry, uh, that which Voldemort does not value, he takes no trouble to comprehend. Well, we're grateful to Luke and Audubon for being willing to share their knowledge and help us comprehend important information about the economy. 
Our goal is to share the best resources with Talbot County businesses so that you will have the knowledge to make good decisions for your businesses, your families, and your community. And we hope this information gives you a leg up on your competition and helps smooth your path to success. And like those before me, I sure hope we'll be back in person next year. But if not, we're still committed to bring you great information that you can use to succeed. So Amy, thank you. I couldn't agree more, Cassandra. Well said. And uh, as usual, this is always a great uh, presentation. Thank you to uh, Luke, certainly, and to Honorbon. And I'd like to send a special thank you to our friends at the Tidewater Inn, who uh, we certainly missed them this morning, uh, but they were a lot of help behind the scenes uh, before now. Thank you to them. And to the Avalon Foundation, uh, Nick at M&T Bank, Nash Tri Gas and Oil, and uh, everyone at your team over there. Uh, everybody at Sage Policy, thank you. Really great job, everyone. Until next year, stay safe, be well. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.